everyone hello hello welcome 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 friends and family my lovers and lurkers welcome to hanging with hillary come on and let's hang but first give a roaring welcome to my co-host david maldo <laughs> you get that roar exactly on time everyone i've been practicing I'm so happy you are here. I'm Hillary Scarl, and this is my fabulous co-host, David Maldo. We are here every Wednesday talking to actors and artists. And of course, this week's guest, you have to welcome the fabulous, the talented John McGinty. Give a warm welcome. <laughs> and come and go so quickly here. All right. And we also have our fabulous interpreter, Julie Pond. Thank you again, Julie, for making our show accessible. How are you doing, John? Welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here. It's just really cool to see all the different frames that's going on here on the set. I'm very excited. And of course, cheers to all my cheers. friends there. Cheers. There we go. I'm it's still it's it's still a tad early here in Los Angeles. Where where are you right now, John? I'm really in New York City right now. I live in New York City. It's still eight early. Eight o'clock here. Eight o'clock here. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's eight o'clock which is early New York time. Is New York coming back to life now that the pandemic feels like things are slowing down? You feel like people are going out? I do, yes. I mean, this past year, it was so amazing to really, I did a lot of assessing of myself and I now that to see people out in the world, you know, be, with humans, you know, this past year, there was a lot of political environments and things changed and it was mulling around in the city, but it was really excited to see what's going to be for the future and what that's going to look like. Especially now with the Broadway theater, they're starting to open back up this fall. And as an artist to go back to work and, you know, I love you all on Zoom, but it is very much time to put Zoom aside and be out there again. Absolutely. I can't not wait to go back and see live theater. I've been like happy that so many artists have been able to pivot. This is how this show came about. We just started the show in January. I met David when he came on to uh, do our signing Santa with Robert DeMeo. And we had so much fun making Christmas and Santa accessible over Zoom and these sorts of sets. We're like, we have to do something together. So uh, we started the show and I've got so many awesome friends, including you, that are uh, creative people and do lots of different things. And David and I talked and said, you know, we want to really show the journey of what it's like being an artist. It's not like you wake up, you know, as your senior year in high school to say, oh, I'm going to be a theater major. And then you become a professional actor and then you become a 
TV actor and then a movie star and you're on your way. I think the journey is often so complicated and crazy and people who are in it for the long haul like you really have built a fantastic career and you've worked on your craft and it's been so great watching all the things that are happening for you. Uh, for people who don't know, um, so I want to read your bio for anyone who doesn't know the fabulous John, uh, and you feel free to correct me or interject, but uh, John has done so many fabulous things. He appeared recently on Broadway in Children of a Lesser God, and also in Kling King Lear with Glenda Jackson. And John did... Yes, he did a great Glenda Jackson impersonation before. <laughs> oh, I'm embarrassing oh, already. Well, I have to tell you, Glenda Jackson was just the most amazing artist with King Lear. First of all, before that time, I had never been involved in a Shakespeare uh, pr production before. So it was my first time ever. So to sit and see how it's performed and to be able to watch and observe, I mean, it's a really, it was gratifying at the same time because I hope that I get this right. I think she's 84 years old. Mm -hmm. And to watch how she came on with as King Lear and became with the beat, she kept on the beat. She never and missed Every beat. single time she would walk off, light up a cigarette, take a wig, <laughs> Take a take a smoke and come back on like nothing happened. I was exhausted just doing one thing, and she did all of this in very smooth. It was amazing to watch. You amazing. know that really shows when you have trained and studied in your craft, you have technique, and that's the thing I think a lot of younger actors or new actors don't realize, especially doing theater when you're doing eight shows a week. If you don't have that foundation to stand on, it's, it's tough. And to see those legends that truly know how to pace themselves, how to conserve their energy, what they need to do. It's a whole process, which I love and I miss the theater so much. I'll get back there. Anyways, back to your bio. So uh, John's film and TV credits include Wonderstruck on Amazon, he recurs on the TV show This Close on the Sundance Channel. He appeared on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist and most recently New Amsterdam, which I totally want to talk about in one of our segments. His theater and credits, this is an impressive list. If you know theater, you're going to love this. Uh, he um, was, was in the world premiere of Samuel D. Hunter's The Healing, The Block, which was at the Actors Theater of Louisville, the Hunchback of Notre Dame at both the Sacramento Music Circus and La Mirada Theater, which we are going to talk about that also as well. Tribes at the famous Guthrie Theater. Steppen he also performed at the Steppenwolf Theater and Everyman Theater. And Pippin, and this is the sign name for Pippin, at the Center Theater Group with Deaf West among dozens of, not Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> But Pippin. But I want to give uh, everyone a little view, really, of some of your work. So John was kind enough to uh, to share with us his actors reel, which we are going to show a two minute clip in the screening room, and then come back and talk about his work. So um, there's no dialogue, so no need for captions or interpreter. So we'll be back in two minutes, and here we are. Um, at the Actors Reel in the Screening Room. Nice. <laughs> 
two of us are sick too. The two of us sit. The two of you sit. Oh, no, no, no. John, you look fabulous. I promise you look fantastic. Seriously. And I love seeing just the diversity in your work. The fact that you did a musical, that you did a drama, that you've got comedy, that you've got poetry. The diversity of it all is so great to watch. Uh, Now, I uh, saw you in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I have to say, John, your performance was so incredible. It was so strong. And I couldn't believe when you said you were the first deaf person to play the role, even though Victor Hugo wrote it for that, that um, Quasimodo is deaf, correct? That's correct. Yes, he is deaf. Um, He lost it from the sounds of the bell. When he pulled on the bell, he lost his hearing there. Now, what was it like to be the only deaf actor in a fully hearing cast and a musical? What were some of the challenges of playing the Hunchback? Well, you'll have to go back to the beginning and how we asked. Fortunately, I did a pre-workshop to work on new musicals, nothing related with Hunchback. The guy was wonderful. His name was Glenn Castle. He fortunately looked previously with a deaf actor of Linda Bove. And when the director of Children of Lesser God back in 1980s, some, I think it was uh, at that point. So he had experience at working with a deaf, deaf actor. Uh, as far as a musical, and my role, I was, you know, usually back dancing backstage. I mean, we didn't even meet. We didn't work together. We had nothing to do with each other at that point. So I got home and I was doing some research on who Glenn is and who he was and what kind of work he does. And I heard, saw that he was the artistic director of the company that was called Music and the scenes that came up and the director of the future and the hunchback was not what was coming in the future. And it was just, you know, Hillary, sometimes it's like, there's just a few days that you have that gut instinct that a light bulb comes on and you just want to do it. There's, you know, no fear, there's fear on how to make it happen. So I had the opportunity to go ahead and I emailed 
Glenn and I said, hi, I don't know if you know who I am or remember me. I was, you know, I was looking at your musicals and I was hoping, you know, you were working, I saw you were working on Hunchback and thought like you were looking maybe a deaf actor for this role because I knew that the role of Quasimodo was deaf. And at the same time, the Sacramento Music Circus or that team that I was with at that time, the role required singing. And if you've ever heard me sing, you might <laughs> plug your ears and run, but, but the opportunity to email him and I explained what the possibilities were to collaborate. And he was like, well, why not? Come on in and let's, you know, come into the screening room and as you can see with my phone and the songs mm -hmm. for Hunchback, all the songs. And that was called Out With The In Moment. And I went ahead and looked- uh, Up the piano arrangement, yeah. Thank you, yes. And then I, you know, I handed, and they were looking at me like, why are you handing this to me? Why do you have your phone? And I said, just, just give me your hand, excuse me, give me your hand. And so I handed my phone into their hand. So I pushed play and the music started going and I went with it and I got a call back. The next thing I knew I was flying to Sacramento and we only rehearsed 10 days wow. before we opened the show. But it wasn't all, I wasn't the first actor. That's not what was important to me. First deaf actor, that wasn't important to me. It was an opening to a door that I think for the last few years, there were three or four other deaf actors that the important Quite thing cool, is opening yeah. that door and making the opportunity for others. And only need, you only need one step in. I don't care if I was the first deaf actor or not, I mean, that's not what's important. It's to see the opportunities that can then occur for other deaf actors along the way and the community. I totally agree, John. I think to be able to show directors, producers, artistic directors that, hey, this is a possibility, that it's not a challenge. If anything, it adds a really interesting layer to the show. And like you said, to collaborate and the best people to ask, well, how would that work are deaf actors because they've done it. They have great ideas of about solving problems about how that would work. And you had a fantastic singer who was paired with you. That was your voice to, um, to be able to share that. And it, it did strengthen the role so much in the performance to have that partnership. And I, I've got other projects I want to talk about, but I want to show a little bit, David. So I think we're going to jump to the screening room and then jump back here because it's, it's such an important production and your performance, like I said, was, you just want to hug the hunchback and take him home with you and be like, quasi, it's going to be okay. You can just lean on me. And it's just, there's something that's so sweet about your portrayal of him. I mean, he's, he's such, a, he's, he's such a rich character to begin with, but to really see the layers you added to him and you made him really lovable. Okay. So let's just show, we're not going to show the whole thing, but let's just show a minute or show uh, two of John playing the hunchback of Notre Dame. Below me. All my life I watch them as I hide up here alone Hungry for the histories they show me All my life I memorize their faces Knowing them as they will never know me All my life I wonder how it feels to pass a day Not above them But to part of them And I One day out there, all I ask is one to old forever. Out there, where they all live unaware, what I'd give, <laughs> what I'd dare, just to live. And the weavers and their I love 
love it. It's so amazing. <laughs> well, uh, something watching that film in the back of my mind from the very beginning, the of the run, the beginning of the run, there was no uh, prosthetic on me or anything on my face. So there was no makeup there. So they did have another actor and they added that. But the director chose to have nothing on me to show my facial expressions and thought that it was fine. I thought it was fine. a bad idea because during the end of the run, maybe about a month and in uh, Asia, like for the whole time, my my face stayed this way. <laughs> two and a half hour show, yes. <laughs> After two and a half hours, and in the at the end of the week of the performance, uh, it was just you know routine, going through, getting used to it. And then I went up in the second set, and I couldn't move. No, it's frozen. It, it did. It literally <laughs> froze. I was like, oh my god! Oh my god! I, so the whole time I was like, hey, let me hunch back like this. And <laughs> this is what I look like. And oh. so I got off stage and I couldn't even move my face. Mm -hmm. so I really it's like having carpal tunnel, but in your face. That's that's not good. <laughs> Overuse. Well, and that's, yeah, that's exactly. terrible for a deaf actor when half of the language is on your face. You just... Uh, muffled half half of your grammar but what a good show and i'm so lucky i got to see it live uh and then also i saw you in pippin which was great um that was a super it was always one of my favorite shows what a fun show what 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 oh well like new kids i was a new kid on the block with that i know 18 i had just moved to la i you know i what I loved about that show, there were just so many talented deaf actors involved yeah. that I had so many people to look up to, like Teal, Teal Forsberg, Forsberg yeah. right? And Anthony, Anthony yes, Anthony Natale. And then Ty G and- Ty Biorgiano and Alexandria Wales, yes. And Troy Coetzer, yep. I thank you for that. Yeah, did I miss anybody? I hope I didn't. Um, there's another, there was another dancer. There's an, there was another dancer. No, 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 no. I think I got all of them, but my point here is it was so warm and it, they were so kind and it made me feel good to know that the deaf artists taught me and I got there's something from that. And our younger generation that's out there have such, so much to learn. I mean, I'm still learning every day, whether you're young, older like in Pippin it was just the inspiration of you know the professionals of Deaf West thank you so much and they all became we became great friends after that to this day. I remember you were such a bright eyed like bushy tailed like that came across yes but that was so sweet about your role I could see how happy you were to be there and your energy was just through the roof and it showed, it totally showed. And that was that was one of the fun things about watching you. I was like, look at that. John is <laughs> playing in some of these very established actors like Troy, who's been around, you know, for a while. And just, yeah, but look, you were going toe to toe and you just absolutely, you know, were absolutely part of the ensemble. Uh, and then it was, all right, now I'm going to skip on to uh, the TV show New Amsterdam, which you were just on a couple months ago as a doctor, which I love. So what was that experience like? I have to be honest. Being involved as, well, not really intern, but I want to say more of what can we deaf actors play? There's nothing we can't do, deaf or not. You know, you could be a lawyer, an attorney, you could be a teacher. Why can't we do all of these roles? So in the real world, there are deaf people that have a variety of jobs. So I wanted to do a shout out, you know, the casting director, David Cap. He really was a huge advocate for people with disabilities 
in general. Fortunately, he casted me in King Lear when I was on Broadway. So he knew my work. And so then I auditioned for that new Amsterdam before and there was no role that I got. So, and that was okay with me, but you know, I wanted to be seen in the room was the main point. Maybe, you know, a, another deaf person would get an opportunity. So two years later, they called me again for the doctor's role. It's a very small role, but I always teach my friends and the younger generation to please understand that don't dismiss a one line role or a role that isn't, you never know that that small role could lead to many amazing opportunities. And so when I booked the job, I went on the set and each experience, the job itself gave me a huge impact because New Amsterdam, I remember I went up to the director and I said, you know, here's the deal. The doctor's deaf. What type of background story does he have? I'm assuming he works here for many years. What's his relationship? So I could get the point of, you know, are they new friends? Are they people he knows? You know, you go in and you ask these questions. So there's no feeling of like, I'm not sure what I'm doing here and putting my, you know, just go for it. Don't be fearful. So the director was Michael Silv Silvis, and I may be the interpreter may be pronouncing it wrong. What I loved about him is that he used to go to RIT, Rochester Institute um, for Technology. So that was a little bit of a reassuring and relief. And he knew some sign, yeah. So I always wondered about like, what should I sign or should I speak? And then he's like, why are you asking me? If you want to sign, go ahead and sign. He said that. And I was like, wow. I was like, how mind blowing is that? Because all that time up to then, we'd always talk about why, but his response was do what you feel. I mean, so my point is some things come out of that. It may surprise you what will come out of the, even the smallest role. And the people there were very warm. I mean, really, it was a beautiful experience for me. Now you're really lucky. The director was familiar with deaf culture and you said he signed some. So he was not only knew you, but probably was welcoming. It was probably one of those things that he provided the interpreter without questioning or pushback. Did you have to do any self-advocating for communication in any way? Or do you feel like everything- oh, No, I mean, well, I always do. I do always have to do that in that regard for uh, you know, asking that I wanna make sure there's an interpreter and they brought that in. There was no resistance on this job, specifically for this program, for this project. And I have to say, I'm sure you've gotten feedback that people are absolutely thrilled to see sign language on television because it doesn't happen very often. So to be able to see something in your language, your, the feedback must have been incredible, even though it just was one or two lines, that it still made a huge impact because it doesn't happen every day. It's happening more. Exactly, exactly. And I love the fact that it, the storyline was not about, oh, this doctor who became deaf. It was just like, no, it's... It's a doctor who happens to be deaf. Like, I think there's another recurring role of a little person on the show who's, I think he's a doctor or uh, a surgeon. He's somebody who's always there also. I don't think we've gotten to know him really well, but he's just there as another doctor, another part of the staff. And it's great. I think the more diversity that you just see that becomes, oh yeah, this world is really diverse. And guess what? There are deaf doctors, deaf lawyers, deaf bankers, deaf CEOs. So it's, it's nice good to, to see, see it being normalized. Like it's exactly. not, not just like it's acceptable, but Ooh, it's right. a special right. different thing. It's just right every yeah, day, so. everyday stuff. Is there a dream role of a character you've always wanted to play, but haven't played yet? What would be a role you're itching? Okay. So first of all, I always wanted to do a role that has nothing to do with 
It hasn't been done yet. It's something brand new. It has not been written yet. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the one role. Okay. Here's a story. There is a role that I've always wanted to do. It's Hamlet. Hamlet. Now I'm going to tell you a story. I haven't told you this story yet. I want to say it was in 2016. Cleveland. I'm actually from Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was the year before 2016, there was a great region theater company in Cleveland, Ohio that opened up. So I just showed up. I, there, I didn't really audition. There was like a one minute Shakespeare, one minute of a current model, you get in. A modern monologue, yeah. Thank you, modern monologue. And then they emailed me, the director emailed me, Regional Theater in Cleveland. And he said, hi, John. I don't know if you remember who I am, but we are actually doing a full production of Hamlet. Wow. As, and as Hamlet, I, so ask me about Hamlet. And I was like, that was do, that's what happened when I did The Hunchback. At the same time, I was doing Hunchback at the same time. So I was very excited after that. So, but the same time, I also got offered to do a new musical that had the potential of going to Broadway. But the, the role the was show? very small. What was the show? Oh, The Other yeah. World is the name of the show. So I had Hamlet, which was one option, was already there, or a small role that would might lead to Broadway. So which one should I choose? And I went back and forth for, I said, well, my gut is telling me to drop Hamlet for a few reasons. First of all, I never took, did a Shakespeare show before. I wasn't ready. And second of all, the other world may lead to possibilities. So guess what? After the workshop, they cut the No, 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 no. You never know where things and what will happen. And so you have to take risks. But the beauty is I got a lot of networking out of it. You know, you hear those stories. And as actors, you hope to be put in situations where you have to choose between roles. And it's not easy. And like you said, you have to go by your gut and what information you have and hope that you don't make the wrong decision. But at the same time, you work a lot. So it's, I, I am so not worried about you. You've got some great things coming up. Um, okay, I wanna talk about a few more things here before we head to our next set. Uh, so you are also the first deaf person to be the Eastern Principal Council for the Actors' Equity Association. Tell a little bit about that, because that's a pretty big responsibility because you have to be voted in. Well, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely for the Accurate Equity Association. So you are all, we're all union members, actors. For the theater. theater, yeah off-Broadway, maybe, you know, wherever in on Broadway. So the, the council is a variety of, um, there's regulations, making up laws and opportunities, being aware of, you know, things for safety. There's a lot of things that are involved. So the things that I like to focus on is diversity and inclusion, specifically making sure all that deaf people have the opportunity and make sure they have accessibility and the things they need. I've been on it for the last three years now. And most recently, it's been very, it's been amazing. All the theaters were shut down. All the politics that were popping up and going on. And we as a council had to, we were, you know, shook the, shook everything up because we had to, you know, money wise, and everybody thinks about money, but we have a union to fight for and we, that fought for us. So we need to fit what was happening in the climate and in the environment for, for today. So the, you know, AEA was all very much so as of today, we're thrilled to see theater starting to reopen. But at the same time, 
making sure that the diversity and inclusion is a priority. It's so important. I remember, God, when I was an actor in New York, there was these auditions for regional theater and it was not so inclusive back then. And there wasn't a lot of diversity and therefore a lot of diverse actors wouldn't even show up to audition. And there was a handful, I remember, this is, gosh, I'm dating myself, but like back in the, you know, uh, early 1990s. And I remember at one point the Actors' Equity Lounge, there must have been 200 of us waiting to audition for maybe a dozen regional theaters. And one of the casting directors come came out, stood on a chair among 200 actors who were all waiting and warming up and going over sides, stood on a chair and said, don't you dare yell at us for lack of inclusion for casting because look around you, you are all white, able-bodied, hearing people. And if you don't show up for these auditions, we can't cast you. So don't complain to us when your seasons are all white and lack diversity because you're not here in this room. So go get your friends and tell them to audition because we're looking for them which was kind of amazing, but I heard later that a lot of them said, why should I bother showing up? Because I never get cast. But now things are changing and I am hoping that situation wouldn't happen again where it would be just all white, able-bodied, cis, hearing actors. <laughs> that the diversity realized that yes, not only are we looking for you, but it's, it's part of the fabric. And now that there's more directors and writers and producers that represent that diversity and more shows, I think people are feeling like that they can be more diverse. The struggle's not over, but I think it's still happening at some point. Well, well, you know, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even five years ago, as it's been changing, the change has been, the train has been moving extremely slow. Chugging along, yeah. But the big question is like, we have to ask ourselves, who's responsible? You know, I would say that I'm responsible for showing up and selecting the right things to, you know, to contact with people and to do research and do their homework. I don't know, I, I'm asking, I'm, I can't speak for all, but coming back for the accountability and being able to, we, individuals mm -hmm. are, are responsible for being the best ally. If I see a person of color, a deaf person, and I know there's several, you know, POCs of people that I know, I was like, go, go to the theater and, and try out audition. So it's really important that we just be mindful of what's going on around us. I was just talking with one friend the diverse and inclusion. And I have to say, to be honest with you, uh, there are so many, well, I'm exhausted. Yeah. There are a lot of panels talking about diversity, inclusion, talking about what we should be doing or what we can do. And I'm thinking, I've been going, you know, intentional. The talk has I mean, been the for the last 10 years. Yeah. And I don't understand why there isn't any change with all that conversation. That's my inner struggle. Just stop talking and do it. I agree. But why is that? Why? I mean, that's the, that's the self question I ask myself. I think people are not always mindful. They're not always aware. I mean, as a hearing writer, director, producer, I sometimes have to remind my colleagues of, hey, have you thought about maybe making sure that your audition is accessible and providing and then sign language interpreter and opening it up or suggesting to write, you know, so it's just, it's just putting those things out. And I think that every time someone sees a deaf actor or, you know, a little person or a person in a wheelchair or, or, you know, BIPOC representation, that then it's more encouraging. All right. I did not mean to get on a soapbox. This is so important. I do want to talk about this, but 
Uh, here at Hanging with Hillary, every single guest gets to choose where their happy place is. And David is my magical co-host who makes the magic happen here. And because we all need a happy place to go, especially um, it's been a tough year. So John, if you were to go anywhere in the world that is your happy place, where would you bring us? Well, I wanna say Turks and Caicos. David? Let's make it happen. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, this is good. That's the best I'm gonna go for that. <laughs> now you said you actually used to live here, right? Shortly. I did. My family, oh, it was a lovely home. Mm. They built it from scratch. In 2004, I hope if my family, sorry, I apologize if I got the, if my family is watching, I apologize if I got the year wrong. Uh, the place was a place for family to get together. We have, a, we have a lot of memories. We went fishing and boating and just stayed on the ocean and relaxed and let the, the waves come up to us. And then a few years ago, we felt that it was time to let that go and do some more traveling and getting there, the expense of traveling and getting there as we decided to sell the home. But there are times that we'll still go to visit, rent a place. So it's not completely gone out of, out of my life, but. It's, we can just go there in David's hot air balloon, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, it's over here, right? There we go, okay. I know, we're backwards here. <laughs> Everything is flipped. What's your favorite place, Hillary? Oh, you're the first person to ask me that. I don't know. All right. My favorite place that I've been is the Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland. And it was just the most magical seascape. I fell in love with it. And it was so beautiful. I actually cried when I saw it. It was just emotional and overwhelming that it that's so that's one of my favorite places on earth. But for some reason, I think if I had to choose my next magical place to go to, I have been itching to go back to Paris. I only was there a few days after college and it rained the whole time and it was not a happy trip. So I want to go back there when the sun is shining. And now I feel a little older, a little wiser. And I think I would really love to sit outside in a cafe. You're old. You look like you're about 20. Love you. You're a liar, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, now I see your sign name coming out, the Winky. <laughs> Yeah, see, well, that's oh, I love that. I have this, I love winking. I don't know why I've always, my friends used to tease me that if someone would wink at me, I'd be like, oh, that's it. I'm your <laughs> friend forever. I feel like it's a secret that you share. I love it. I think we now you're now you've been married for how long, John? Because I can't I can flirt with you still, but your husband may get jealous. Not too jealous. I'm sure he feels very protected <laughs> and safe. I don't know. You didn't see that, right? No, he didn't see. Oh, anything. you have a very handsome husband. So you've been together for a long time. We've been married since 2018, but we've been together. I want to say almost 12 years now. Now, how did you guys meet? Come well, on. do you have time? Yes, come on. Wait, I'll give you the short version. So mm -hmm. I went to college in Boston, Northeastern University, and I graduated in 2009. And at the same time, my husband, his name is Steve, and he worked at the um, pharmaceutical company. And I took him, there was a, this pharmaceutical company and there was a, an event that was celebrating, I, it was a holiday party, I think. And his colleague and the, his partner back then was an interpreter. And I went to school, we went to school together. So she went to the holiday party and said, oh, I want to let you know, John's hosting a going away party. Why don't you come? And we're like, oh, we don't want to go. It's late. We don't want to go to another party. We won't have any fun. So they decided. And then fast forwarding, 
we met and he didn't know sign. It was very like his ABCs maybe and how to sign nice to meet you. So the interpreter friend taught him, taught Steve how to sign. You know, he had a few drinks. So Steve was drunk and he didn't realize that how close he was to me. So he was like this, nice to meet you and bumped himself and bumped me in the nose. And I was like, what? Oh, hello, X out to you. I'm all done. Get out, get out. <laughs> so we had met, we met again, and then the rest is history from there. And that's why my nose is crooked today. So it's all his fault. It's his fault. He bl I always blame Steve. I'm like, Steve, uh, he's like, stop it, stop it. You know, it's funny. During our tech, John, you were like, oh, I've never done comedy. I think you were such a funny guy. And that is crazy that you've never done no, comedy. No, no, no. Okay. Okay, it's two different things. I am being myself. Thank you for thinking that I'm funny. I do appreciate that. But as a comedian, I am terrified to be a comedian. <laughs> to do like comic acting. Comedy, yeah. comedy stuff. Yeah. You have to have the exact type of... Um, no. mm -mm. I'm more afraid of... It's too hard to be funny or try to be funny. If I'm just, you know, that's too frightening. I disagree. So, yeah. So when I direct you in a comedy... Uh, I definitely know you have it in you and that's all you need is just to be you. I think that there's, there's a misconception, I think, of what it needs to have that comic timing. And there are a lot of actors who th think that they do comedy because they put on a big show and they don't realize that comedy is often very subtle. And you've got that subtlety. And especially for film and TV, that's where, as long as, oh, all right, we're going to get you over the sphere. You've got some time to think about it. So. My heart is pounding as Good. we speak. I'm sweating. Good. You're up for a challenge though, right? Yeah. I know. I see. You're, you're an artist and I can see I that. I accept the challenge. Good. All right. Fantastic. Because it's. I don't think, you know, I, I think I might disappoint you though. I doubt it very much. No, see, and it's good that you set the bar high. That is really important. Oh, now you have to, now, now it's drinking time. I totally agree with that, but. Sure, sure. Cheers, you want some? <laughs> uh, all right, let's see what else we can um, talk about. I'm terrified I am about comedy, Hillary. See, oh, help me, help me. That's good. You can, you, and it's good to have that fear because then maybe that's your character. Maybe if you just, you know, play it exactly as you with that fear, I think that comes across. I think sometimes when um, actors get too cocky about what they can do and they don't challenge themselves, maybe that's not as funny. It's like anything else, you just gotta practice it. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, yes, ma'am, excuse me, yes, ma'am, thank you. <laughs> I have such a long list of things I wanna to talk to you about, but uh, I'm gonna jump straight to some good stuff. So I know that a lot of younger actors, they, they do watch this back later. And if you had a message to give to, uh, to deaf actors or people who want to be an actor, they're young, maybe they live somewhere else in the country, they just haven't been given that opportunity yet, what advice would you give to them? How do they start? I mean, it is a great question because I always believe that each individual has a young artist in their unique soul of journey and to find that it's really important to learn from each other and keep, keep practicing. I mean, there's many years of getting experience. It could be, you know, a big name. It could be a big role, it could be Broadway, it could be, but you still have training. So you watch other people while you're working and you will learn something new from the other person around you, other people around you. And the younger generation and also don't be afraid to ask for help. I mean, I'm asking for help every day, 
myself because, you know, one thing is that if you're passionate about something or there's something that you just feel like, I want to try this, do it. There is no, you know, there is no stopping you. You can try something. And then when you get there and you realize, oh, that worked and that didn't work, that's something you've learned and it's okay. And my final comment for that also is, someone did ask me, what's it like to be rejected? The rejection part. Uh, rejection is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And the reason I say that is because there are, that's a new door that was open for you. Whether you reject it or not, it doesn't mean that it's not worth it. You know that something will then come up for you eventually in the future with that, that door. That is so true. As I was mentioning right before the show, I actually had two rejections this week, not one, but two. And, and it's interesting. We don't talk about that. People put on... But you're right, exactly right, John. What you were saying is that, you know, I have maybe 10 different lines in the water right now. And it's it's interesting that we don't often share, oh, bummer, I didn't get this, or oh, I was up for this and I didn't get picked or whatever. But we celebrate our wins. And I think as artists, it's important to also talk about how many things you don't get, how many disappointments and things you work really hard on. And one thing, a lot of people do self-generated work. That's why I love writing my own content. I love doing this show, you know, with David that, you know, nobody hired me for the show. We just, of course, we aren't making money off of it, but it's something that we love to do. And I have a, I have a good time doing this. And it's interesting what you were talking about before for younger actors, that in the past, the National Theater of the Deaf, NTD, had a summer school. And I don't think that is back. That has not been on for many years. But it was great as the one place up and coming deaf actors could go and train, learn from the old guard, and get their training. I think there are some new programs. Monique Momo Holt, I think, has a summer program for deaf actors that she's doing. Um, so hopefully we'll get her on the show. So be able to talk about that. And the other thing, like we had Rosalie on the show and she does her own content. Same thing. She doesn't wait. Yeah, we love her. Love her. Love her. Love her. And one thing I've always admired about her is she, she does her own work. She self-generates her own performances, songs. She's been doing a series lately in the car that she'll just translate which she makes it look so easy which is ridiculous and not fair at all <laughs> she just <laughs> yeah. i totally agree i'm like how do you do that how do you do that rosalie's just magical that's how uh, uh let's see um oh oh here was the other thing you john sent me this long beautiful bio of growing up and is going to school. I think you need to write a book about a lot of your experiences, but I picked a few things out that I wanted to talk about that uh, you mentioned that you didn't really have your deaf identity until college. Yes, yes. I was born hearing and I was very sick and I lost my hearing when I was one and throughout my education, well, that journey, I had a bye-bye program, which was really total communication, which means signing and speaking at the same time. And then it then switched to a pilot program that was only speak, spoken language. It was spoken English, it was not in sign. And then I went to a private school that taught and supported just me who was deaf for two years. And then I went to another deaf school, it was Clark School for the Deaf for four, for four years. And a lot of it was signing was not allowed. You had to learn to quote unquote, listen and speak. So then I had to go back home and I was mainstreamed into a public high school till the 10th grade. And I was the only deaf person there with an oral interpreter, means they did not sign. They just, I had to shift and understand the point of what I was seeing and I kind of lost, 
I lost my language of sign because technically my first language was sign. I was, if you remember preschool was total communication. So there was sign language there and I learned it, but mm -hmm. I lost all of it because the rest was a spoken English journey. And then in high school with an oral, what's called an oral interpreter. And um, that was all day. And one quick funny story about chemistry class and the oral interpreter who was sitting across from me and using her mouth so I could read her lips. But she had not, did not have that skill. That person did not have the skill of the interpreter. And they were trying to say H2O, which is, you know, water. So you're supposed to show the bond of uh, CO and H2O together. And I thought the interpreter said bomb because on your lips, it would look like B -O -B. water was going to explode all the way through. That, that time I thought was oh my, God, my body and I totally freaked out. So I, I said, no, I, I mean, that's just a little brief, you know, it's H a bond. H2, to, yeah. to, to bomb. Right. <laughs> it looked like bomb on her lips. And so I asked the interpreter, can you please teach me some sign that you can support with it so I won't get that freaked out again. And that's when my identity started to turn on back on. And I was like, oh, I need to know more sign language. I was a late bloomer, but that's just the so short version of it. But I hear that so often. You hear that a lot from kids at Gallaudet who come from hearing families. Uh, there's, I know a lot of deaf actors who didn't even know sign language at all until they get to Gallaudet. And it's, it's an incredible journey to go through. It's one of the very few cultures that I think that you're not naturally born into that is something that's acquired, not necessarily born into, so. Yeah. Right, you're correct, absolutely. Um, and you said that also fed into your self-esteem and how you felt about yourself like I think that's got to be tough feeling like I don't know who I am or my place in the world feeling like you don't have a language or a place and that came later now I mean that it, it came a little bit as a surprise because you strike me as someone who's really confident that you don't have something to prove that you're you feel like you know who you are so it's hard to imagine you at a time in a light time in your life where maybe that wasn't so clear. Where did that come from for you? Again, I do, we, we talk about rejection. So we really do have to, you experience the pain and the sorrow that comes with that and your whole life of feeling frustrated. And then it's the, 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 the account of overcoming that with support and the real understanding and desire. I mean, there is no timeline, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to go, you know, my life experience in general, I am very grateful. I'm grateful that I had the self-esteem problems back in the past for myself. And then where I got to today, that helped me get to where I am today. Mm -hmm. And what the younger generation needs to know is it's okay what you are feeling at this time. It's natural what you're going through. And that I think that it's important that if you need help, ask for it. There is no shame in that. I mean, I'm in my mid thirties and I'm still asking for help. I mean, just like I was before, but more so. Do you have young actors you mentor? Um, either way, whether like that there's young kids that you guide. I what I do. I am fortunate enough to be working with a workshop for the deaf schools here in New York City and teaching deaf kids talking about anything related to the, uh, to theater or the arts. I have learned so much through them myself. I mean, they are so loud in a good way, loud in a good way. I'm, you know, it's, it's this passion, this voice they have and they're determined and it's a perfect fit for what's happening in the environment. And they're actually the voice of tomorrow and I really see that that coming. 
I agree. I think those kids are so lucky to have you. And the fact that you're willing to offer to be a mentor and offer that support, that's a very generous offer. So young people watching, take John up on that. And David, you know what I think we should do? I think we need to head to the bar for a drink. So uh... <laughs> John, we got we have some sushi for you. And... <laughs> And and we put John in a bottle and chopsticks. Chopsticks. Yeah, we forgot the chopsticks. I think we just have to be grabby. Yeah, just eat it all up. I miss going to sushi bars. I haven't been to a sushi bar in a year. I've been making sushi. Oh, what's your favorite kind of sushi? Uh, you know, um, boy, I mean, I love yellowtail. Hamachi. David, what about you? Um, tuna, tuna salmon, anything with tuna or salmon. Okay. All right. Nice. Nice. Julie. I love all sushi. Most. My sister just popped in the chat. Hi, Rachel. Good to see you. She's watching from Indiana. <laughs> so Hello there. Uh, Midwest. Yes, Midwest. How's it over there? You know, you need to pop in. What's your favorite kind of sushi? Oh. Oh, Philadelphia <laughs> roll. No, no. The cream cheese? Yes. No. <sighs> Bye. <laughs> I'm done. I'm all set. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that's a made up sushi. I don't feel like that's real. I feel. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I like, uh, you know, I, and I like the specialty rolls like caterpillar roll. So um, like different things or the crazy ones that have like four different types of fish. I think that's fun. But I've been making sushi there. I go to little Tokyo. Yes, it's not pretty. Um, not well wait till you see it it's absolutely a mess there's no instagram love happening here but <laughs> oh, mess is good though mess it, is well good. you know what it is is i think my knife skills suck so i think like i can't get the chopping so everything turns into a hand roll like a cone and uh yeah so it's good but i go to little tokyo and i get fresh sashimi and learned how to do the sushi rice and then that has been good, especially, you know, a year of a pandemic where I don't think it is a good idea to do sushi to go. That feels weird. Did you get sushi to go where people delivered sushi to your house? I did. Oh. Well, near New York City where I was, they have this great sushi place and I used to go often. And then we moved a little bit further away and they don't deliver. I was very disappointed. <laughs> Well, hopefully things are opening up now and that we can brave it out. Oh, and Rachel says, um, I don't know what this means, Rachel. Yes, we hear race cars in May. I don't know what that has to do with our conversation, but she loves yellow fin sushi. I don't know what hearing race cars in May, is that a joke I'm just not getting? I'm deaf, so I don't know. You're asking the wrong person here. I mean, <laughs> there's no race cars to be heard by John. <laughs> David, I don't know. Can you decipher my sister's comment about race cars? I don't know. It, it is May. That part I understand. Maybe my sister's had too much wine and uh, martinis as well. It might be happy hour in Indianapolis. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel, we'll, we'll decipher you. We'll figure it out. We're in a little bit delay. So um, yeah, she's in Indianapolis. Uh, uh, all right. So you here at the bar. Okay. You promised to tell at least one embarrassing story. It's when we were talking about what to talk about. You said, well, I do have some embarrassing stories. So it's your fault for actually suggesting that and bringing that up. And you said you were going to save it for the show. So here we are. And I okay. am ready so first of all i do want to apologize to the interpreter julie 
because I did tell her the story, but now I'm going to tell a different story. So I apologize, Julie. So that's okay. I'll back it up. I got your back, Julie. So <laughs> I know I forgot about this last one. So I did a show here in New York. The show was called, oh gosh, okay. Movement, movement. of the spirit. Oh, of the soul. Of the soul. Movement of the soul. Yeah. And so the play was about two hours, two and a half hours with no intermission. My, I was on the stage most of the time throughout the two and a half hours for my role. There was a lot of, I was having some bathroom bowel issues going on during that run. I have no idea. It seemed like it was a reoccurring theme. I, I don't know. So it was bizarre. So one time uh, during the show, I, you know, I felt I was feeling good. I tend to have enough water that, you know, enough to hold the food and wait and just do what I have to do. But it just so happened, I remember this one day I was starving. So I ate too fast, first of all, and I drank too much water. And I got into the show and we were going along doing what we had to do. And at one point I was sitting on the bench with other actors and my stomach started to make noise and growl. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh shoot. Um, okay. I can't leave the stage for another 15 minutes. So it kept growling. And it got louder and louder that the other actors who were hearing could hear it. And they kept looking over at me like, are you okay? They were kind of like mouthing to me. I'm like, just keep going. And I was trying to just, I remember I had a mic, but it was in the back here. Yeah. Right. And it was taped here in the back. And I did have gas and I farted and it <laughs> came up through the mic. So it was like going through the speakers, but being deaf, I mean, I just going, but when I sat back down on the bench. So when you have to go, you go. Oh. And that was it. And I was like, it was mindful. It was not that much, but it was so mortifying. Oh. I was like, I don't know what to do. I couldn't just leave the stage in the middle of the show. So I was like, you know what? This is part of the character. I'll make it part of the character. You have to go to the bathroom. Why not? Oh, oh my God. It well, was you Fine. John, you know what they say to never trust a fart, you know. <laughs> that's that's like <laughs> exactly. no, no, I didn't try. No, mm -mm, no, you got that hit the you know, bingo right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, and oh yeah, so my, yeah, that's a good character decision. So my character poops his pants. So because why not? It well. <laughs> I'm surprised you told that story. That surprised me that you would tell a poop story. You want to turn, Helen? Oh my gosh, look at the time. We are out of time. So I see, I see. We'll have to gather again next time. Mm -hmm. uh, I No, I'm all about the embarrassing stories. The thing is, and like right now, we've got a small audience, which is fine. I just don't know who's going to be watching later. Everyone in the chat's been very quiet. So I appreciate my sister chiming in but i do know afterwards that the show does get watched so i'll have to i'll think of a good story I have Although, one. can i do one i have a quick one oh david please i have a quick one all so right david i do a uh, guitar stream um and, and i you know like like this but but um it's just me playing guitar and i take requests and someone requested the van halen song drop dead legs a song i really like and like most van halen songs or most songs from the 80s it's about pretty girls so i didn't realize i didn't have my audio set up correctly so what i was supposed to do is have my microphone muted because i don't want people to hear me singing because i don't sing well and have the the music going through and i had it the opposite so no one could hear the van halen song that was playing in the background no one could hear my guitar that i was playing all they could hear was my voice so i'm just so they could hear nothing because I wasn't singing and I'm dancing around and they're telling me in the chat, the chat's saying, you're muted, you're muted. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. I'm oblivious. I'm just having fun. 
And David Lee Roth says this one line in the song out of nowhere. He just yells, giant butt. And I sang along with that. And I usually don't go, not that that's so dirty or filthy, but I'm usually very, very clean. So my viewers who know me, who never hear me say any bad words, see me dancing around and out of nowhere I yell, giant butt, with all of this joy. And for months, that's all they could talk about. Oh my gosh. That's very funny, David. I think it's even funnier that you told that story inside of a bottle. Yes. <laughs> uh, you look like a genie in a bottle. Ooh, <laughs> I, think I, I like that. Rub the bottle. Like, yes, you do. You look like a genie ready to come out, right? I like Hey, that. you need to do that. We need, John, we need, has there ever been a deaf genie before in Aladdin? I think that would be so much fun. Yes, I could do it. We could do this. Yes. Uh, the chat is a little bit delayed, but we have. Lauren, give a shout out to Movement of the Soul. She says she remembers that. Yes, yes. Good shout out. Um, saying that was very fun on that run. David, thank you for sharing your embarrassing story with us. Oh, thank you for letting me. That's that was fun. Well, and, and so, you know, David is very, very clean. He will not curse at all i remember the first time i heard you say she's such a b and she's such a b and you would say letter b and you oh, would the not b word yeah. yeah i was worried that i was worried that i was being a b word <laughs> like i don't want to be a b i don't want to be and a b so word <laughs> and it's so sweet i mean i have no trouble trouble calling someone a bitch or calling myself a bitch but you know it's funny saying, oh, she's such a la, 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 la. Come on, John. I can't imagine that. Winky, winky, winky. <laughs> I know. It's like to see these drinking games really need to happen in person because it's if the, the three of us or four of us are in four completely different states. John's in Florida. You're near New York. I'm in Los Angeles. And Julie... Uh, you're in Florida also? Connecticut, Connecticut. Connecticut, that's right. So yeah, here we all are kind of in a bar together drinking, having sushi that's been sitting on the bar now for a little while. So yeah, I don't know if I trust the sushi on the bar. So you have, <laughs> yeah, we are, so we are getting together to doing drinks very soon when you come to LA or I come to New York because it's been too long. Oh my gosh, I hate to do this, but it's almost time for us to wrap up and take us back to our talk show set. This has gone so fast. This time again. So I'm gonna get, I know we're back. So thanks for making that magic, David. And John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Julie. Thank and Julie, you. thank you so much for interpreting and being a rock star. So, John, we're doing this again. You are coming back. I cannot wait to see your upcoming projects. Uh, please follow John. Where, where can they find you on your social media? You can follow me on Instagram. It's really the John McGinney. That's it. Uh, John McGinty. All right. You heard it. So follow John. You can keep track of what he's up to so we can come and hopefully see you live in person, see you on the screen soon. But thank you for being here. Thank you again, David and Julie. And with that, we'll see you next week. So follow and subscribe. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.